mess up everything that the worship team did up here on stage and just challenge them a little bit this week. <laughs> Keep them on their toes. So um, if you've been here for a little bit, you've probably heard me speak um, about or speak on Psalm 1. Um, that psalm was placed in the beginning of the psalms for a reason. It wasn't the first psalm ever written. It was actually one of the later psalms to be written. However, it's placed in a unique area because it wants to teach us how to read the rest of the psalms. And the, the core of that message was that we are to meditate on the word over and over and over again. And that's a really important message for us today as we go into uh, today's sermon. Because uh, today I'm going to be talking about anxiety. And it's something that a lot of us have to deal with. And sometimes in those moments, you, you don't really have a lot going for you. In your mind, you think, I might be alone. I might be the only one that goes through this kind of thing. And sometimes it's that simple truth of just repeating and meditating over the word time and time again to remind yourself that you are valuable, you are someone who, um, who is not doing this alone, and you are loved by God. Um, so the, the verses that we're going to be reading today are in, in the Psalms. It's Psalm 38, verses 13 through 22. I'll give you a few seconds to open up to that. And it's a psalm written by David, and it goes like this. I am like a deaf person. I do not hear. I am like a speechless person who does not open his mouth. I am like a man who does not hear and has no arguments in his mouth. For I put my hope in you, Lord. You will answer, Lord my God. For I said, don't tell them or don't let them rejoice over me. Those who are arrogant towards me when I stumble. For I am about to fall. My pain is constantly with me. So I confess my guilt. I am anxious because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and powerful. Many hate me for no reason. Those who repay evil for good attack me for pursuing good. Lord, do not abandon me. My God, do not be far from me. Hurry to help me, Lord, my Savior. Let's pray. Father, as we read through these words, as we've learned before, that we are to meditate over and over again upon these uh, words that you've gifted us, that you have uh, given us through your preservation and your will, uh, we just ask that, that this word would, would be open to us today, that we would understand and hear with the message that you have for us, Lord. Uh, we pray that moving forward, we would understand that you are the God of all power, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that in you, we do not have to be anxious. We pray in your name. Amen. So for a topic like today, sometimes it's nothing, we can't do anything more than repeat these simple truths to ourselves over and over and again. And it's no wonder that many of us might have anxiety. Uh, we have these viruses spreading all the time, like the coronavirus which people are affected by and are, are worried about. We've got wars across the world. We've got leadership woes here in the States and across the world. And we have all sorts of injustices that we hear about all the time because of social media. So it's no, wor it's no wonder that we have things to worry about. Um, but what do we do for the person who's at the end of the rope? What do we do for that person who has nowhere left to turn? They feel like they're isolated. They feel like they're alone. What do you do when you feel that way? We all have stresses in our life, and stress actually leads to this anxiety, but it doesn't have to. Um, stress is defined as a state of personal strain or tension resulting from the pressure that is in your human life. Anxiety is a little bit different. Anxiety is some kind of vague presence in your life. It's a vague, unpleasant emotion similar to worry that is experienced in anticipation of something often ill-defined as misfortune. Do you see that relationship there? Stress is a pressure put on you in your life, and anxiety is how you respond to that pressure. 
So it's necessary in your life might be a deadline for school or work, or it might be getting enough sleep, it might be your circle of friends, or it might be traffic. Shout out to Don. Um, traffic is a funny one too. Um, people get really mad, especially in Dallas. I don't know if that's a city thing or if it's just a human thing, but people get really mad here and they race each other, they tailgate, they kind of get even. Um, they spend a lot of emotional energy in traffic. I look at this from a distance because I'm from Illinois. There is no traffic, and we have nowhere to go. If you've ever been to the east or to the to the Midwest, it's there's a lot of corn. If you want to see corn, you can go see corn, but there's nowhere else you're going to be going, so just no reason to rush. And because of that, I, I look around, and probably people are mad at me on the ratio because I'm going slow. I feel like that's how driving should be. I'm just relaxed. And people are probably mad at me because I'm not driving the way that they do. Um, but driving is interesting. That, that it's a stressor that all of us have, but we treat it a little bit differently. Not all of us worry about these things. The stress is there for everybody, but the way it pressures us is a little bit different. Some of us um, don't just have that stress. We turn it into an anxiety. We let the pressure overthrow our mind and our emotion. Uh, so maybe instead of just doing well at school, you put an extra uh, pressure on yourself to have the best grades ever, or you have to get recognized at work. See how that pressure is amplified. Maybe in traffic, you don't just have to get to your place on time, but you have to show everyone around you that you're a much better driver than they are, and how dare they cut you off, I'm going to cut you back, right? Um, maybe instead of just uh, having uh, pressure from our circle of friends, we succumb to that pressure, and we're afraid of what our friends think about us. And we have this peer pressure that overcomes us. Maybe you have anxieties about that little light that's left on at night. And you're like, I can't sleep. That light has to turn off. There's these little things that kind of get in our head, but they're different for every, every person. So what is it about these things that some of us respond well to and some of us don't. Brings me to my first point, that stress actually doesn't cause your anxiety, but sin does. In our text, we've come to a point in David's life where his stress has caused so much pressure for him that it becomes too much to bear, and it becomes his anxiety. And the world has a lot of good ideas about where these anxieties come from and how to solve them, but David has a different idea. He says in verse 18, I confess my guilt. I am anxious because of my sin. Now, depending on the translation you have, you might, you might read, I confess my iniquity, which is a fine word. They're synonymous. But I think we understand guilt a lot better. We understand what it means to have guilt on our heart and on our conscience. And David says it's because of his guilt and his anxiousness or uh, his sin that he has anxiousness. And that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. We need to ask ourselves, am I the reason for my anxieties? Is it because of something in me that I'm anxious? If we look back at the differences between stressors and anxieties, what is the difference? It's our perspective on the pressure. The way that uh, we view the world and the way that we view ourselves changes the result of these pressures. So going back to the driving example, um, there's a Walmart right by my house, and in the parking lot, there's a three-way stop with the fourth side getting a free, um, the right-of-way. And if you know me even a little bit, I'm always the guy, I'll hold the door open for you, I'll let you go first, and all these things. But when I'm in the car, like stop signs kind of are a suggestion. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Every single time at this Walmart specifically, I just feel like I have the right-of-way. <laughs> I'm never on that side. I never have the right of way, and yet I'm always kind of just going through. Even if there's cars there, <laughs> I'm confessing, church. Um, <laughs> there's something about our perspective, and that's why we always bring up traffic, because for some reason, when we get behind the wheel, our perspective changes. All of a sudden, we're not just this fragile human body. I'm in a tank. I'm in a car. I have bigger rights than I did before. 
That plays in our mind. Our perspective changes and we change because of that. Our sin is wrapped up in that perspective. It's these little ways that pressures become our anxieties. It's because our sin is wrapped up in that stress. And pressures can be good. They can challenge us. They can bring out the best in us. They can make people rise to an occasion. However, we often flip them. It's good to get good grades. But if that's all your identity is about, it becomes a pride issue. It's good to have a promotion at work. But if your identity is wrapped up in doing the best at work, your status means more than anyone else, and you're willing to walk over people to get it. If your marriage, which is a good thing, if that's, if that's the only thing you're thinking about, or maybe you're single and you just cannot wait to get married, you think that's going to solve all your problems, talk to a married person and ask if it solved their problems. It doesn't really work that way. And we have these societal pressures on us, and, and maybe you're just thinking, this is what I need to get over my loneliness, and, um, and it's just not going to, it might not be that way. We could be fearful um, of a good speech. I want to be uh, as articulate as I can, but if my perspective is because I want people to look at me a certain way, all of a sudden it changes the motive. You can drive fast to get to the hospital, but if you're driving fast to cut someone off, the motive changes the outcome. We have these desires deep, deeply rooted inside of us that can be very selfish. And if they are the selfish form of that desire, it's often something that we are blind to as well. And that leads me to my next point. Because we're blind to it, often uh, we cannot fix our anxieties, but God can. We each have these things in our lives, so how do we fix them? Uh, the world might say, here's, here's a, you, you can look up any article about stress or anxiety, and it's going to have a how-to list. It might include yoga and essential oils and tea, hot cocoa, uh, boba, if you're really out there. <laughs> coffee obviously works, so you know, I'll put it on the list because it is of the world, but coffee generally works. Um, and we have songs about, about stress and anxiety. Bob Marley, the late great theologian, says, don't worry, be happy. Every little thing is going to be all right. Is that good theology? Is everything all right in our lives? When I'm anxious about this thing that happens tomorrow, does it just go away? Sometimes people sitting in this stress, sitting in this anxiety, things don't feel all right. That's how the world attacks anxieties, but this is how David does. In verses 13 through 15, he says, I am like a deaf person. I do not hear. I am like a speechless person whose mouth Who's, uh, who does not open his mouth. I am like a man who does not hear and has no arguments in his mouth, for I put my hope in the Lord. You will answer, Lord my God. And then in verse uh, 19 through 22, he says, My enemies are vigorous and powerful. Many hate me for no reason. Those who repay evil for good attack me for pursuing good. Lord, do not abandon me, my God, do not be far from me. Hurry to help me, Lord, my Savior. The world tells us that we can go and solve all of our anxieties with yoga and boba, but what if your anxiety is people? What, can you ignore them? Sure. Dallas is a big city. Go over to Fort Worth. I can avoid anyone if I wanted to. I, I probably don't see most of you during the week unless I make an effort. So we can avoid people if we want. We can unfriend them on Facebook or social media. But David's answer is not to avoid the thing and not to avoid people, but to come to the Lord and wait. He says that he stops listening to what the world has to say about him. Verse 13, he says, I am like a deaf person. I do not hear. Now, prior to this, it's, it's a list. It's a laundry list of all these people that have wronged him and the way that the world is against him and how he is so isolated. And then he transitions to, I am not going to listen to them any longer. I am like a deaf person. And he stops arguing back. He continues, I am like a speechless person who does not open his mouth. No arguments are in my mouth. That's a really hard one. 
Have you ever been in an argument with someone, someone close to you who should know you and you think you are just right, so you gotta let them have it? <laughs> and David says, I'm not gonna argue. I'm not gonna prove my point. It's not easy, but this is how he does it. He says in verse 15, I put my hope in you, Lord. You will answer, Lord my God. David has decided to cast his worries away. The stress, the pressure, the anxiety, all of it, he's laying before God. We're told to do this all over scripture. This isn't specific to this psalm. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be, no be known to God. Supplication is a funny word. Um, it, it basically means like begging with an anticipation or joy that it's going to happen. And the best way that I have come to think about it is like my son Abel, if any of you have been around him with food, he does this dance. He's like gets his legs going and then his arms start going and he's like dancing in anticipation. He's supplicating for me. He sees that I'm making the food. He knows it's coming. So he's begging with anticipation. And it's interesting because we, we kind of, I think we forget to pray like that. I think sometimes we'll pray and we might be begging without that expectation. Abel knows I'm going to feed him. Anyone who's seen my son knows that I feed him. He's got a little belly going on. So that's why he's, he's, he's excited. He knows that his begging is going to be rewarded. But I think that we forget to do that. I think we come to God, especially in these moments of stress and anxiety, I think we come to him maybe hopeless that he's not going to solve the request that we have for him. So we might pray and we might think, but we forget to supplicate. In Psalm 94, it says, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations delight my soul. When you come to God, are you delighted in your soul for him to console you? Psalm 38, 4, just before this, he says, my iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden that weighs too much for me. Um, Alistair Begg is a, a fantastic Scottish pastor. I think he's in Ohio. I don't know what he's doing there. Um, if I was in Scotland or from there, I would, I would probably stay in Scotland. Um, but he, he has a story about this uh, Irish potato man who comes up to a farmer. He's got a sack of potatoes on his back, and he comes up to this farmer, and the farmer has a trailer, and he offers him a ride. He says, hey, you, know, you, you look like you're working pretty hard here. Why don't you get on the back, and I'll take you to where you're going? And the Irishman says, that's great. I'll hop on. So he gets on, on the trailer, and a couple miles down, the, um, the farmer looks back, and he sees that the Irishman still has the potatoes on his back, but he's sitting on the trailer. He's like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> so he turns back and he says, I'm giving you a lift, you know, take off the load, uh, relax. And the Irishman says, oh, you know, no thank you. Um, I was just always trained to work hard and I don't want to put any undue burden on the trailer. <laughs> and he just laughs and keeps going. I think we do that a lot of times with God. We come to him with our burdens. We come to him with our requests and this thing that is just weighing on us, but we forget to give it to him as if he can't bear the load. How many times do we come to God asking and asking, but forgetting to give over the burden? And one of my favorites is in 1 Peter 5. He says, uh, cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, a little bit of context about 1 Peter. He's talking to leaders and overseers and elders, and with that extra responsibility comes a great burden of care for people. And um, the weight of our struggle isn't meant to be taken alone. So he's guiding them and saying, you need to cast your anxieties away because you can't bear it alone. And then later he says, after we suffer for a while, God will confirm, strengthen, and establish you. For some of us, we might be sitting in a while right now. He's saying in 1 Peter, this isn't something that you make the request in like that, like the genie. You get three wishes and it's done. But you might be sitting in that request for a while. And some of us might be sitting in that now. 
But we look to David in this verse, and, uh, and he waits too for the Lord. Now, I love the term casting in 1 Peter 5. He says um, he's casting. I don't know if any of you go fishing, but at least you probably know what it's like to, you've maybe seen a fisherman. Uh, when you cast a line, you don't just like plop it in the water. You're not going to get many fish that way. You have to chuck. It's an action, and it takes a, a strength and a skill. You have to throw the line in order to, to cast so that you can go fishing. And um, that's how we're supposed to come to God with our anxieties. You're supposed to throw them. Now, it doesn't mean that you've abandoned them. They're not a part of you any longer. It doesn't mean that you're no longer tied to them. That string is still there. Those anxieties are still a real part of your life, but when you reel that in and you struggle to get that reward, it's going to be different. You've got God at the end of that line. You've got the maker of heaven and earth, the person who holds your atoms and the cosmos together, and you've cast to him. I imagine that Moses had to do this when he complained to God, when God gave him his commission to go and be the spokesman. He said, I can't do this. I am not an eloquent speaker. He was afraid. But we all know the ministry of Moses now and how great he became. I imagine that he cast those anxieties to his God. And because he struggled with that and struggled through that with God, he became the Moses that we know today. He probably had to work hard to get over those insecurities and, um, and to speak well, but he did so with a confidence not in himself but of God. So this is, this is why turning to the Bible and prayer, we say this all the time, you should probably wake up to your Bible and pray or go to sleep with your Bible and prayer. And this is why it's so important because every morning and every night we should be casting those fears away. But if we're not, I mean, what are we saying to our soul? If I instead turn, turn to my phone and Facebook, I'm saying Facebook is more important to my soul and what they are feeding me are, I mean, we all know the pictures we put up online. They're, that's not real life. No one's happy 24-7. My baby cries and I don't put up many of those photos, right? Um, there's a, there's a, a, an aspect that we're feeding our souls daily that isn't reality and we're tricking ourselves. We're saying what's happening out there in the world is more important. What's happening in my emails and in my job, that's more important. What's happening in my school is more important. Or even good things like, like uh, my relationships. Um, we know that good things can be turned against us if we make them greater than God. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about this in one of his books. Um, I, I love this book, The Screwtape Letters. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I'm pretty sure they're free online. Most of his work is free, so go download a PDF or an audio book. It's fantastic. But in the book, um, there's two demons writing letters to each other. It's Screwtape writing to his nephew, Wormwood, and he's giving advice on how to um, kind of derail the human, how to distract him, how to make sure that he doesn't focus on God. And um, this is the, the quote. I, I should have a quote up here for you guys to follow along. He says, There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy. The enemy in this sense is God, because it's two demons talking. He wants men to be concerned with what they do. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. As this condition becomes more fully established, you will, gradually, uh, you will be gradually freed from the tiresome business of providing pleasures as temptations. As the uneasiness and his reluctance to face it cuts him off more and more from all real happiness, and as habit renders the pleasure of vanity and excitement and flippancy at once less pleasant and harder to forgo, for that is what habit fortunately does to pleasure. You will find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You no longer need a, great, uh, a good book, which he really likes to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. You can make him do nothing for long periods of time. All the healthy and outgoing activities which we want, to, uh, we want him to avoid 
can be inhibited and nothing given in return. So that at last he may say, I now see that I spent most of my life doing neither what I ought nor what I liked. You will say these are very small sins, but do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It doesn't matter how small the sin are provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from light and out into nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. We need to ask ourselves, is the devil just trying to distract me from being present with the Lord? Because that's all it takes. It doesn't take some grandiose gestures, just a distraction. Does he want me to be distracted with my anxieties? Don't be deceived. The devil is out pursuing you and me. But he is more sneaky than we give him credit for. He is not so obvious to post his attack on a billboard, so we need help. And this is our final point. Jesus takes our anxieties so that we can live in him. We know that we need help, but we ask why and how can God help? If you're struggling with a problem, who do you go to in your personal life? Do you go to the nearest stranger on the road? Or do you go to someone with life experience who has known you for a long time? And one of the greatest things about God is that he personally knows us and he has personally been in pain. He's not a God that's distant. Isaiah 53 calls him the man of sorrows. So that was prophesied about Jesus in Isaiah. How do we see him living that out in his life? All of his life, Jesus had people doubting him. All of his life, the Pharisees plotted to kill him. And his best friend betrayed him at the end of his life. John 13, 21 says, When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in his spirit and testified, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And then soon after that, so we already see in his spirit he's troubled. He's got some worries going on, some pressures from the world. And soon after that, we see a great moment of pressure coming at the Garden of Gethsemane. At the Garden, Jesus knows what is about to happen to him, and he's invited his friends to pray with him. Anyone who's read the story knows that three times his friends just fall asleep. They're not trying to abandon him. They have good intentions. They want to be there for him, but they are not in the same situation as Jesus. So they continue to fail him. So time and time again, they fall asleep on him. And Jesus begins to feel so much pressure from what is about to unfold, he asks God the Father to take it away from him. That's a big ask. And the pressure is so much. He feels the pressure of the world on him so much that his pores begin to bleed. You can imagine the, the pressure of the galaxy all coming to a head on Jesus Christ, so much so that his body just can't take it anymore. We can say that we have a God that knows what it's like to feel stressed. But under that pressure and under that stress, he did not cave to anxieties and he did not cave to sin. Instead, he comes to the Father in prayer and supplication. He knows that the Father's will is better than his own. And he knows that he will be comforted going to the Father. Jesus didn't just go through this anxious moment, however. He conquers it. Uh, in the Old Testament, the word anxious is used a lot to describe water because water was kind of unruly, uncontrollable, and they would call the seas anxious. Jesus, a lot of times in his ministry, is calming water. We see it in Mark 4, when Jesus is asleep on the boat, and all of the disciples are going crazy, and he wakes up and says, ye of little faith, and he stills the water. And then we see it again in Matthew 14, when uh, Peter walks out, to, out of the boat and to be with Jesus, and only their area is calm. The rest of the sea is treacherous. And what happens to Peter? He's good 
as long as he's focused on Jesus. But the second he looks away and notices what's happening out there in the world, he sinks. And again, Jesus' response is, ye of little faith. Our attention, when it's, when it's drifted off into the world, fear and anxiety can creep into our souls and we can begin to sink. When we come to him, however, and we do so in a great faith, like my little boy's supplication, we dance and pray to Jesus, um, we can be sure that he's going to do something great for us. Um, why can he do this? Not because he's God. That's a cheap Sunday school answer, but because he actually has done the work to conquer anxieties. He humbles himself to the state of being a man, not so that he can say, um, I can just, I can take your anxieties, but he literally does it. In the garden, we see him full of agony over what is about to happen so much to the point where he is bleeding because of it, and then he goes a step further and he takes our sins on the cross. The things that we are anxious about, Jesus has already taken control of. This is why we can hand over our anxieties to him, because he's already taken your sin. We agonize over these worldly things, and our anxieties are entangled in our sin, but when you focus on Jesus, you begin to realize how great he is and how he has already overcome it all. Um, as the band comes up, um, I just want to turn our focus on a, a really sweet song that I'm reminded of. Um, a lot of us know it, and it goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us pray. Father, we come to you excited, knowing that you love us, that you've numbered the hairs on our head, that you know our name, that you are a good father, and that you have prepared great things for us. And Lord, for those who are anxious today, for those who feel like they've been sitting still for a while, waiting for your answer, would you encourage us? Would you remind us how good you are? Would you show us the price that you've already paid so that we can live in you? We humbly ask that as we go forth this week, we would not be riddled with attacks by Satan, that we would be comforted knowing that you are near and that you know us deeply. In Jesus' name. The band um, will begin to pray, and we have the elements, um, juice and, and, and bread. Um, these are symbolic of the blood of Christ and the body of Christ, which has been broken for you. So if you're a believer, um, we just ask that you come and, and, and meditate on your sins, confess them to God, and hand them over. Don't be like the Irishman with the sack of potatoes on his back. Hop on the wagon and unload.